Mrs. Royal. Oh my God, I'm happy to be here, folks. I am, uh, I'm 28 years old. I know I don't look a day over second marriage. Uh, I saw that It movie recently. Have you guys seen like the trailer for the new It movie? Yeah. For me, the scariest part of these It movies uh, was when I realized that that clown and I have the exact same hairline. I was like, oh, he does the up and out too? That's a bummer. I looked up the actor who plays Pennywise the Clown. He's just like a super handsome 26 year old guy with like a full head of hair. I was like, oh, he only looks like me when he wants to terrify children. That's nice. I hate that when a handsome actor gets like a bad hairline for a role, we're all proud of him, you know? Like Johnny Depp in Black Mass. I remember reading this article that was like, he spent three hours every day in the makeup chair to get his balding look. It's like, I could have done that off the street. <laughs> no problem at all. I actually found out I have a receding hairline at a comedy show. I was in the audience of a comedy show in the way that like Paul McCartney still goes to concerts. <laughs> the comedian on stage, he goes, yeah, I got a receding hairline, but that guy knows what I'm talking about. And he pointed to me. Before that, I literally had no idea. <laughs> I'm just worried that's how I'm gonna get all of my bad news from now on. <laughs> Just random comedians on stage, like, yeah, I got herpes, but he knows what it's like. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> My ex-girlfriend told me that trying Rogaine couldn't hurt. <laughs> I was like, if we're not counting feelings, then yes. <laughs> you think I wanted this? You think I wanted a Peyton Manning forehead? <laughs> in a Papa John's body. I didn't ask for it. I didn't vote for it, and if elected, I will change it. <laughs> the other day, I, was, uh, I lost my ID, and a bouncer wouldn't let me into a bar. He was like, do you have any other way of proving that you're over 21? I was like, yeah, the whole thing. <laughs> He was like, do you have any physical way you could prove it? I was like, I could take one of those BuzzFeed quizzes you can only pass if you're a 90s kid. <laughs> can I tell you about Hey Arnold? Would that help? I don't know. I thought that as I got older, I would turn into like a grizzled man. And every year, I just become more of a suburban mom. I recently said the phrase, sincerely, I think Weight Watchers is changing my life. <laughs> I meant it. <laughs> I love it so much. I like it because it doesn't tell me what to eat, you know? I'm a man. Like, I tell it what I ate, and it tells me to feel bad about it. It's a healthy system. My first day on Weight Watchers, I, uh, I drank an orange juice, and I found out orange juice is very bad on Weight Watchers. It was six points. That same night, I drank a Miller Lite. And on Weight Watchers, Miller Lite is three points. It has completely changed my morning routine. I'm much happier now. Weight Watchers is also a social media app. It has like a social media part of it. I don't know if you guys know that. It's my favorite social media app because none of my ex-girlfriends are on it. It's nice. I love looking at it, though, because, like, whenever I look at Instagrams and stuff that makes me jealous, you know, it's just, like, my sexiest friends getting engaged to each other while wearing bikinis somehow. And then I go on the Weight Watchers app, and it's a stranger just being like, my engagement ring fits again. <laughs> Those are my people. That's who I like. That's who I want to hang out with. I used to use a different weight loss app. It was called Lose It, and uh, I stopped using it because it encouraged you to track your exercise, and that is not my bag, baby. Uh, one of the exercises you could put in on this app was sexual activity, but the minimum amount of time you could put in for sexual activity was 30 minutes. 
Okay, pal. I didn't know this app was for Casanovas only. Why don't you make one for the working man, huh? We built this country. 15's fine, we all know it. Like, I used to weigh a lot more. I used to weigh over like 300 pounds. I lost like 100 pounds a couple years ago, uh, and now I gained most of it back. I, <laughs> I, I don't want to lose any more weight. You know? I, I want to stay overweight enough that when I'm bad at sports, it's still funny. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Have you ever seen a guy in really good shape miss a layup? <laughs> You're just like, what a bitch. <laughs> you see a guy that looks like me miss a layup, and you're just like, my man! <laughs> Get that guy a Hawaiian shirt, he's with us. <laughs> my friends will be like, well, you must be getting laid more now that you lost weight. And let me tell you guys, losing 100 pounds is an amazing way to find out the problem is your personality. <laughs> I don't like to meet new people now that I lost weight, you know? Because I meet someone new and it's just like, ugh, you're not even proud of me? <laughs> this sucks. It's no way to start a friendship. I was talking about fat shaming with some friends. I think fat shaming is a cool term because it insults the people it's supposed to defend. And, uh, <laughs> My friend said, well, skinny people actually have it just as bad. Is there any difference between being called a twig and being called a 300 pound monster? <laughs> like, one of those is way meaner <laughs> and oddly specific. Uh, <laughs> I actually felt good the last time I stepped on a scale. I stepped on a scale and it said max 400 pounds. I was like, well, at least I'm not as fat as that Max guy. Huh? How you guys doing? Ah, it's a fun one. Come on. Are we allowed to have fun? What's going on here? <laughs> oh, man. I thought, yeah, I'm getting into cornier jokes as I turn into a, a nice middle-aged woman. I, like, all I care about now is jokes about wine. That's the only thing I like. I just like wine humor. It's all I care about. I used to think it was really corny, and now I'm just like, that's the only joy we have left in our culture. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Like, the, like, it'll, be, it'll be something, it'll be like, uh, save water, drink wine. You know, something fun like that. You'll see it at like a TJ Maxx. I'm a Maxinista. <laughs> if you guys know that. That meme. My friend has a like, lake house that's like covered in that stuff, and I love him all so much. He has two I think about all the time, though. He has one, uh, one that says this. It says, uh, the best cure for morning breath is a glass of wine. <laughs> I saw that, I was like, that is a cry for help. <laughs> you can't have a sign in your house that says you drink in the morning. I feel like they're gonna keep getting worse. It's gonna be like, diagnosed with cirrhosis? Time for service. <laughs> He has another one in his house that I literally think about every single day, maybe every hour, uh, because it's the craziest sentence I've ever seen. This is the sentence. Yoga class? I thought you said pour a glass. <laughs> it is bonkers. <laughs> because it's not yoga class, I'd rather pour a glass, which would be one thing. It's I thought you said. <laughs> so the woman, <laughs> The woman that wrote this just has a hearing problem. <laughs> that's all that's going on here. And we can all agree as a crowd that yoga doesn't rhyme with poor uh. <laughs> like it would make more sense if it was Torah class. I thought you said pour a glass. But then he could only sell it to Jewish teens. They're not even allowed to drink. <laughs> I think... <laughs> I think about this so often that I just started carrying it around with me everywhere I go to show people. Uh, it's my favorite thing in the world. If you're listening, just use your imagination. Uh, it's so fun, I literally just keep it in my pocket and my only hope is that someday someone's gonna try to assassinate me and this'll stop the bullet. <laughs> and then the cops will be like looking over my body and they'll pull it up and they'll just be like, 
That doesn't even fucking rhyme. <laughs> Man, I hear you, brother. <laughs> My whole life is uh, weddings right now. I'm at that age. All my friends are getting married. It's fun. I love weddings. They're like my favorite thing in the world, but it's expensive to go to a lot of them. Last year, I got invited to 13 weddings, which I could not afford. I couldn't afford it. It got to the point where I'd see like a fancy letter in the mail, and I'd just be like, oh no. Please be anthrax. <laughs> If just one of these was anthrax, I would save a fortune. Uh, it got so bad that at one point, I had to take a mega bus from New York to Chicago to go to a wedding. And that is a 19 hour bus ride. And people kept asking me, they'd be like, so Tommy, why'd you take the bus? Like as if there'd be any answer that wasn't financial. <laughs> Like, oh no, I could have afforded the flights. I'm into bus culture. That's my thing. The people on the bus are my family, I love them. I was on this trip from New York to Chicago. Uh, about 13 hours into the trip, we stopped at a Burger King. Uh, I don't know if I was alive or dead. I have no idea. But I'll always remember it because one of my fellow bus mates who, who was a sister to me at this point, she, she went into Burger King at two in the morning and she got a salad on a bus at two in the morning and then she put ketchup on it instead of dressing. I was like, do we turn the bus around? We can't see who we were going to see anymore. We're all different now. Like, we can't do this anymore. I can't smile again for at least two years. I love going to these weddings, though. I always get too drunk at weddings. Uh, is anyone else normal? <laughs> I'm always suspicious of people who don't get drunk at weddings. Like, I get it if you don't drink, but if you drink moderately at a wedding, I just want to shake you, you know? Just be like, you know it's free, right? Are you out of your mind? Like, you know we send them a crock pot in the mail and we black out, and that's the deal. I don't know if you signed the contract, but I signed it. There's a thing that happens at a lot of these weddings I go to where there's like a big circle in the middle of the dance floor and you get thrown to the middle of the circle, you do like a wacky oh, dance move, yep. I, uh, I don't have any like funny dance moves, you know what I mean? So I just do what, uh, what chubby white men have done since the dawn of time. I just take my shirt off. Uh, it literally works every time. It's, uh, it's the only play in the playbook. It's actually how Taft won the election. <laughs> we always use it. The last wedding I went to, it was a wedding in St. Louis, and I did them in the center of the circle, take my shirt off, throw it in the air, big cheer. And then it landed like right on a middle-aged woman's head. And <laughs> I felt so bad. I was like, wow, this is the exact opposite of catching the bouquet from the bride. <laughs> Like, you will be the next to get divorced. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't make the rules. I went to my first bachelor party last year that was wild. There was a, a situation where it was like a stripper at an Airbnb. And uh, you guys can probably tell I'm like the alpha of my crew. You know, you can catch on to that. So my friends were like, why don't you pick the music? I was like, yeah, that's what the tough guy of the group does. And pull that off. That's a weird situation to DJ, though. You know what I mean? Like, what song do you play when your friend is getting a lap dance? You know, what mood do you set? It's weird. I found out you're not supposed to play with arms wide open. I creed. I put that on and people were pissed. They were just like, change it right now, you're ruining it. And I just changed it to My Sacrifice by Creed. <laughs> The phone was physically taken out of my hands, so it's good. I went to a bachelorette party last year that was wild. My friend Kathleen had her bachelorette party in New York, and she was like, Tommy, come to brunch with us. I was like, yes, I'm a fucking alpha. I'll be there. It was literally, it was me and 20 women in a hotel. We ate brunch, we drank mimosas, and we gossiped. 
It was the best day of my entire life. <laughs> like by far the best day of my life. Three female friends of mine told me they thought I was special. That never happens when I go to the strip club with the boys. Not once. I do, I wish there was like a strip club for that. You know what I mean? Like I wish there was like a club and I could walk in and a fully clothed woman would just be like, Tommy, I'm proud of you. <laughs> be like, here's a hundred bucks cash, I gotta go. <laughs> Got what I needed. <laughs> a lot of the weddings I go to are Catholic weddings. I was raised uh, very Catholic. I don't know if anyone else feels bad all the time. Uh, <laughs> My mom told me when I was a little boy, she thought I was gonna grow up to be a Catholic priest. It's kind of a weird thing to hear, you know? It's like her saying, Tommy, you could be whatever you set your mind to. But if I had to guess, I would say celibate. <laughs> Some of you guys might have thought that joke would be about the recent scandals, but I'm a good Catholic, so I pretend that never happened. How you doing? I, uh... <laughs> My mom works for the Archdiocese. Okay. I... <laughs> oh, I get confirmed in the Catholic Church. When you get confirmed, they ask you this question. They say, uh, do you reject Satan and all of his works? It's like, I don't know, man. I haven't even heard the early stuff. Can I judge the guy? I had to wear the Catholic school uniform my entire life. Like the plaid skirt and the shirt tucked around the back. <laughs> I did wear a uniform my whole life. I didn't own a pair of jeans until I was 19 years old. Same year I lost my virginity. I don't think it's a coincidence. <laughs> Anytime my buddy's having trouble getting laid, I'm like, hey, bro, throw in some Wranglers. <laughs> Work for me. I think if I put on a denim jacket, I'm gonna have a three-way. <laughs> Works for Jay Leno, he does it every night. <laughs> Him, Mavis, and mystery guest. <laughs> Ryan, can we keep that on the album? Is that cool? All right, good. <laughs> I, uh, I used to take... <laughs> I used to take religion very seriously, like being Catholic very seriously, like to the point where I wouldn't eat before church, because you're not supposed to eat before you eat the body of Christ. And now that I'm 28, I'll just be like, God's not gonna care if I have like half of an edible before this. I don't know if you guys have ever been high in a church. It's the greatest thing in the entire world. I was just looking up the stained glass windows like, oh my God, this all happened. And it was this color. Wow. Jesus was purple. <laughs> I love edibles, I'm, I'm a big edibles guy. Uh, I only have one problem with edibles, here's my problem. It's, it's all kids food, you know what I mean? It's all like weed lollipops and weed gummy bears. It's like, I'm a grown man, you know? It's like, why can't I get a weed cob salad? <laughs> Put some molly in the dressing, have a nice afternoon. I'm trying to know. This year I actually tried LSD for the first time since college. And, uh, it was a great time. I, I went to a party. My friend the next day, he, I, I guess I made him nervous because he came up to me the next day. He's like, hey, Tommy, was I being weird last night? I was like, no, what are you talking about? He goes, well, you kept coming up to me every like 10 minutes and saying, be cool, man. <laughs> I think that was more on my end, I'm sorry. <laughs> But at this party, I, I was on LSD and we were playing beer pong because I was trying to reconnect with nature. And uh, <laughs> we're playing beer pong and I'm tripping and uh, on the table at this party, there is a bobblehead of Billy Joel in an Islander's jersey. And even if I wasn't tripping, it would have been my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> but that being said, I was playing beer pong and I took a shot and it hit the top of Billy Joel's bobblehead, hit a wall, and went into a cup. And I'm never going to be happier in my entire life. <laughs> now whenever I see an interview with someone and they're like, you don't know true joy until you look your newborn in the eyes, I'm like, no. Uh, I know it. Sounds like someone's never played beer pong on acid. Uh, 
Who knows dealing with a loser here? I've been trying to tighten it up. I went to I went to the doctor for the first time in 10 years recently. Uh, apparently, you're supposed to go more often. Um, it's hard to leave the mound when you're pitching a perfect game. <laughs> Healthiest man in America. I, uh, I had to go because I had a cold for like a month and I, whenever I look up like online what to do about a cold, it's always like, well, you should stop drinking caffeine and alcohol. It's like, oh, okay. Let me just change my entire lifestyle for your little remedy, okay? <laughs> hey, I have a sore throat. You could be a Mormon. It's like, no. I went to the doctor. It had been so long since I'd been to a doctor that both the doctor and I were very surprised when anything was good. <laughs> like she took my blood pressure and then she goes, it's actually pretty good. <laughs> like with that tone, I was like, we might have to run that back. <laughs> the reason I don't go to the doctor is because I'm like terrible with blood. I'm like really queasy about blood. 28 years old in the doctor's office, took my blood, I fainted. It's a true story. I fainted like a 19th century Victorian woman, or like me when I was the kid who fainted a lot in school. Um, either of those examples works. I did used to faint when I was like 12 years old. I actually fainted, this is a true story, during sex ed. The teacher said this phrase. The teacher said, an erection happens when blood fills the penis. And I could not handle that sentence. <laughs> I don't even like saying it now, uh, just so you know. <laughs> when I heard it as a 12 year old, I was like, well, I'm out for the count. <laughs> Literally fell to the ground. It was good, it did wonders for me socially. It was good. I'm always so bad about that stuff. Like in high school health class, uh, our teacher was supposed to show us the miracle of life, like the childbirth uh, DVD. She forgot to bring the DVD. So she went on the projector pulled up YouTube and just typed in woman giving birth. I was like, is this really when we want to roll the dice with YouTube? I don't even know what was picked. I was being carried off in a stretcher. I have no idea. So back, back in present day, I'm at the doctor, I come to, it's all, it's insanely embarrassing. Uh, she starts asking me all the questions. She says, uh, okay, do you smoke? And I say, no. And she said, hmm. <laughs> Denies smoking. And then wrote that down. <laughs> I don't know, maybe take my word for it. <laughs> because I look like a smoker, I don't know. And then she asked me, are you sexually active? And I said, yes, because that sounds better than does February count? <laughs> um, <laughs> I've, uh, I've always lied about that. Like, even when I was a virgin, whenever the doctor was like, are you sexually active? I'd be like, yeah. And that's a weird lie to tell to a medical professional. Because like, what am I gonna get out of that? Like as if the doctor's gonna text my buddies to tell them about him. The doctor's just like, yo, your boy is a legend. <laughs> the next doc, you're a good one, man. So I said, I said yes, and she said, hmm, no, I shouldn't do that. Uh, but then she asked me a question I've never gotten from a doctor or a person before. She said, so how is your sexual performance? I was like, I don't know. Remember when I fainted 10 minutes ago? <laughs> Just write that down in your little notebook. Huh? I'm gonna go smoke a cigarette. <laughs> I had a friend ask me recently if my parents gave me a sex talk when I was younger. And I was like a short, chubby kid with braces. I feel like the better question is, could they have given me a sex talk <laughs> with a straight face? <laughs> like, hey, Tommy, why don't you pause that episode of Buffy? Uh, <laughs> looks like you're gonna be getting laid soon. <laughs> People are always like, we need to give kids sex ed younger. It's like, maybe some kids. <laughs> like, I think you could divide every classroom into two groups, and like, the cool kids can get sex ed, and the rest of us can just talk about The Simpsons during that time. <laughs> like, the sex kids can learn how to put a condom on a banana, and then the Simpsons kids can just eat those bananas when they're tired. <laughs> 
I know I shouldn't say sex kids at any point. <laughs> That's what my lawyer told me at least. But uh, <laughs> I never got laid in high school. I used to carry a condom in my wallet all the time. <laughs> I think that's the high school equivalent of being a doomsday prepper. <laughs> Everyone around you is like, there's no way it's gonna happen. And you're just like, I am prepared for every scenario. <laughs> I have a bunker. The most embarrassing thing that happened to me when I was that age is my dad walked in on me masturbating. Has that happened to any of you guys? Has my dad walked in on you guys? <laughs> He used to go from town to town. Very sick man. No, he's a good guy. Uh, <laughs> I will say, in my defense, I thought nobody was in the house, and he didn't even knock on the door before he came in. It's kind of messed up, right? I'll also say, in his defense, I was in my parents' bedroom. Now listen. <laughs> It's where the only computer in the house was. What was I supposed to do? Use my imagination? I'm not in jail enough to do that. I'm a free man! With the same internet as you. So my dad walked in, saw what was going on immediately. He didn't say anything. We've never spoken about it. He has seen me tell this joke. And we still have never spoken about it. True story. <laughs> so he came in, came, and then he just, he just turns around, and then he felt like he still had to break the silence, so he just started whistling. <laughs> so I didn't get a sex talk, I did get a masturbation whistle. <laughs> which you can also get at Spencer's for $12.99. Uh, Have you guys been paying attention to porn this season? <laughs> it has gotten crazy. Porn, all of porn now is just like stepmom, stepsister, all this stuff. It's starting to make me resent my parents for staying together. <laughs> you couldn't have brought a blonde into the mix? Come on. Uh, my favorite porn I ever saw, I saw porn when I was in college called The Man With Two Dicks. I don't want to spoil it. Uh, <laughs> The guy in it has two ticks. Uh, this is a real video. You can look this up on UJIS. Uh, the crazy part about it is when the woman sees for the first time that the guy has two dicks, this is how she reacts. She goes like, oh. <laughs> like pleasantly surprised. <laughs> like wouldn't you be horrified if that happened? And she's like, yeah, it's not really size that matters. It's more of a numbers game. <laughs> It's fun. <laughs> I'm happy to be not living in my parents' house anymore. I live in New York now. I moved here four years ago to pursue my dream of moving back to Chicago in two years. <laughs> I think I have a real shot. I think I can pull it off. I had a very New York thing happen to me recently. I almost got hit by a car at like a four-way stop. I jumped out of the way and I was pumped because I didn't get hit by the car. And then some guy yells at me from another car. And he just goes, what are you doing? I was not getting hit by the car. He goes, you could have got a settlement. <laughs> oh. I was trying to not get hurt like a sucker. <laughs> Little I know, there were settlements on the table. And he goes, I could have got the whole thing. I got a camera right on my dashboard. It's like, buddy, I can't live my life like that. <laughs> Just assuming a weirdo is filming me, presumably to help me in court. <laughs> I can't go around like that. I love living in New York, but people keep robbing me. It's kind of their thing. They say that someone gets robbed in America every eight seconds. Uh, it's usually just me, <laughs> is what I find out. I've gotten robbed three times since I moved here. The first time it was online, and I wouldn't tell whoever this internet thief is, like he messed with the wrong guy, you know? 
Because, like, I don't have enough money to not notice. <laughs> like, I got a call from my bank, and they're like, hey, Tommy, did you spend $120 on... I was like, let me stop you right there. <laughs> I've never spent that much at one time in my entire life. I've literally never gone triple digits, so... <laughs> I had this very old school thought when it happened where I was like, you know what? At least in the old days, if somebody robbed you, they had to look you in the eye. And then like a week later, I got mugged. I was like, oh no, internet is better. Uh, we should do it that way from now on. I prefer it. If there are any thieves in the crowd. Uh, I got mugged, I was coming home one night in Brooklyn. This guy punched me in the face, grabbed my phone, and ran away. Which was a bummer, because I was hoping nobody would do that. <laughs> I didn't say anything cool when I got mugged. I wish I said something cool. That's why I always fantasize about it. Like, I wish he was coming up to me, I was backing away, like, please, sir, no. I have a family to be supported by. <laughs> Or like he takes my phone and starts to run and I just turn to a camera and I'm like, looks like he switched to sprint. <laughs> it is a perfect joke. Uh, I'm not sure if you were wondering. Uh, I had to spend a full week in New York without a phone. I felt like an insane person. By the end of it, I was just like Ebenezer Scrooge, just grabbing boys, like, what day is it today? <laughs> I did. I got mugged. It was the night of the Mayweather McGregor boxing match. So I literally planned my night around watching guys punch each other in the face. Then on the way home, just got it for free in 3D. Because it happened that night, I kept picturing that like famous boxing announcer, uh, Buffer, like announcing my mugging, you know? Just being like, and in this corner. Weighing in at somewhere around 190 pounds. He hopes it's not 200, but he's afraid to check. <laughs> the Irish victim. <laughs> the third time I got robbed, it was like 100% my fault. I take all the blame because I, I got really drunk and uh, I fell asleep on the train home. And the train is not where I pay rent. It's <laughs> um, a fun fact about me. But I woke up and I felt for my wallet. My wallet was gone. What was there was a big hole in my pants where my wallet used to be. So that means that some guy took a knife, cut a hole in my pants, grabbed my wallet and left without me noticing. <laughs> and also let me just say, if you're going to rob me on the train with a knife, just stab me a little bit. Because then it's kind of a cool story. Like right now, the story is just like, someone messed with my khakis. That story sucks. I know it was a guy who did it because women appreciate how hard it is to find pants you like. <laughs> they were my favorite pants, by the way. I am not still bad about it. I looked it up because like, is this something that happens a lot? Is this like a common crime in New York? And apparently it happens so often that the New York City police have a term for it. And the term they came up with is lushing. And they call it lushing because the victims are usually lushes or drunks. Kind of a rude thing to name it. Kind of a victim blamey title. The article was like, it's very underreported. I was like, yeah, I wonder why. <laughs> you can't name a crime after, the, after an insult to the victim and then just expect people to call in. Like, no one's gonna call in and be like, hey, officer, I got dumbassed. And, uh, you can help me with that, but... <laughs> so I've gotten my phone stolen, I've gotten my wallet stolen. Which do you guys think would be worse? Phone. Here's what I'll say. You're right. Because a lot of people say wallet, and all I'll say is you cannot watch porn on a wallet. <laughs> 
beat me, I've tried, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I try to cut down on drinking. I know I drink too much. Recently, a friend came up to me and, uh, and said this. He said, do you remember what you said to me last night? I was like, buddy, what I say to you when I'm drunk is none of my business. <laughs> That's between you and drunk me. <laughs> and if you see drunk me, tell him he owes real me a lot of money. <laughs> I always drink like the cheapest beer at the bar. I told my friend that, she goes, I think that's what alcoholics do. I was like, yeah, wouldn't they know the best strategy? <laughs> I got kicked out of a bar recently because the bouncer said I was too wobbly. I'm not a damn table, I'm a man. But if it helps, I will put a book under my left foot. If that helps. <laughs> He was actually my favorite bouncer of all time because he's like, you're too wobbly, uh, you're too drunk to be in this bar. Why don't you go walk around the block a couple times and come back in? <laughs> I was like, have you never met a drunk person? <laughs> I like to think that that's how he solves all his problems in the bar, you know? Like he sees a drunk guy with his keys walking towards his car. He's like, buddy, buddy, you're too drunk to drive. You can't go home yet. Why don't you do some donuts in the parking lot? Then you're good to go. I know that I drink too much because I'm about to tell a second story where I fall asleep on the train. Uh, <laughs> oh, it was, a, it was a beautiful night. It was the night the, uh, the Cubs won the World Series. And, uh, yeah, it was great. And I celebrated really hard because they don't usually do that. And, uh, I woke up at like 5.30 in the morning and I realized on the train, I didn't have enough time to shower and change before work. So I just went to work. <laughs> Have you guys ever had it where your rock bottom is also the first time you've ever been to work early? <laughs> My boss was like, wow, Tommy, 8.15. And I was just like, ah, <laughs> <Burn me." laughs> I took like a, a month off drinking after that. I take breaks sometimes, but I never wanna, I never say I'm quitting drinking, because if you say you quit drinking and you drink again, you relapse. But if you say you're taking a break and you drink again, you're just getting the band back together. <laughs> I know, I've always worked in office jobs. I find, uh, I find office life uh, kind of depressing. And I, like a couple years ago, I was at an office job and I got in the elevator with a guy and this guy was just like lightly crying. And my first thought wasn't even like, oh my God, what happened? My first thought was like, I know, right? We have to come back tomorrow? This is insane. At that same job a couple of years ago, I had to train someone. That was a weird, I don't know if you guys have ever had to train someone at a job you don't care about. <laughs> my boss is like, show him how to do what you do around here. I was like, do I teach him how to look at my phone? <laughs> I don't know how that's gonna help. <laughs> my dad is a, is a lawyer. I used to think that that was really boring. And then I turned 19 and got a DUI. And I was like, lawyers are sick. <laughs> it's just so cool. I actually, I got a DUI from Northwestern University Police in Illinois. You guys might be thinking, college police can't give a DUI, and that's what I thought too. <laughs> I even said to the guy, I was like, so what does this mean? Can I just not walk at graduation? I was like, no, you're under arrest. It's a good call. Got the right man. My dad actually represented me in court for my DUI. It's sort of like a take your kid to work day thing. <laughs> And it just so happened, terrible coincidence, the court date ended up being January 7th, which doesn't mean anything to you guys, but in my family, we call January 7th Dad's birthday. So, <laughs> true story. As my mom put it, well, at least you're spending time with your father on his birthday. <laughs> I got insanely lucky though, like I don't drive drunk, I don't do it anymore, I, and uh, I got very lucky though, like uh, the cop just didn't show up to my trial, so I completely got off. Like I just got off. 
And I turned to my dad, and he just turned around and started whistling. <laughs> my family's very close, though. We go on trips and stuff. We went to Vegas a couple of years ago. It was amazing. We went to Las Vegas. We saw the magician Chris Angel. I don't know if there are any mind freaks in the house. We saw Chris Angel, the best way to see like a bad boy magician. Whole family blackout drunk. Uh, at one point, Chris Angel turned to the crowd. <laughs> he, he, just, he just had like the worst brags, you know what I mean? Like he, he started bragging about how he has more YouTube views than any magician in history. <laughs> and the crowd went nuts. I was like, what are you talking about? He's an adult. He shouldn't talk like that. <laughs> and then he just started naming magicians that he has more YouTube views than. And one of the ones he named, I swear to God, was Harry Houdini. <laughs> I was like, all right, bud. Like, I've had more Tinder matches than Frank Sinatra. <laughs> He did, he turned to the crowd at one point, and he was like, I'm gonna take a video of this crowd, and I want all of you to yell, mind freak. <laughs> and my little sister, Colleen, was hammered, and she just yells out, you're a bad magician. <laughs> that was my favorite moment in my family history. I am uh, a recently single man. I, I had a mutual uh, breakup with this family, but there was one thing she said where she was like, you know, Tommy, just so you know, it'd be kind of inconsiderate if you started hooking up with someone else right away. I was like, well, you have no idea how good I am at not hooking up with people. <laughs> I'm like incredible at it. But now I just think I'm being a good guy. Every night I get too drunk and I'm playing video games with my roommates. It's like, wow, this is so considerate. <laughs> Am I truly a nice guy? <laughs> Ever since I've been single, my friends have been asking me this question. They all say, like, so, Tom, are you back on the apps? Huh? You back on the apps, Tommy? Huh? You back on the apps? They always say back on the apps. Like, as if I had some legendary run <laughs> before. <laughs> You know, this isn't like 2014, brother. I'm not out there every night. <laughs> it does make me feel like it's an action movie, and they just come up to me like, Tommy, we need you on these apps. <laughs> I just smoke a cigarette. I'm like, I gave that up a long time ago. <laughs> I put this thumb away. I'm never swiping again. I won't even look at a girl who's fluent in sarcasm. <laughs> won't do it. Uh, one thing I've realized from uh, doing comedy for like seven years now is that there's no money in it. <laughs> you can't make money doing it. <laughs> I feel like all the money is in like music and musicals and all this. So I've been trying to, instead of having stand-up, I've been trying to turn the stand-up I have been writing into a rock opera. Um, and I was hoping I could play that for you guys tonight. <laughs> I'm gonna bring out my friend, an incredible drummer, Brad Austin, everybody. Get out here, Brad. This man is a father. So just like the first song in any musical, the first song kind of establishes the hairline. And, and just so you know, it is a rock opera, and I am calling it Tommy. <laughs> I know there's another one like it, but this one is about totally different stuff. <laughs> Deaf, dumb, and blind kid who played pinball With a hairline that's much too high He thought if he had a big forehead He would get more head Turns out that was a lie He read you got your hairline From your maternal grandfather I wish mine was alive today So I could tell him I loved him Then beat his ass for making me think about buying a toupee. Where do you even buy a toupee? I don't know. My first 
first thought was to bite on Amazon But then why is Jeff Bezos bald? I said why is Jeff Bezos bald, folks? And I said why is Jeff Bezos bald? The second scene is kind of about like the weight loss part and it's got like a really cool kind of swing but not swing at all. <laughs> uh. I used to weigh over 300 pounds. I thought that I'd be fine if I drank Diet Coke instead of regular Coke. I could have six-pack abs, but I was wrong. I was wrong. So now I use weight loss apps, even though I know I should just work out and stop drinking beer. But there's no chance. There's no chance. Oh, no, no chance that I'll exercise. I said, Lord, don't make me do CrossFit Because I never want to touch a tire Lord, don't make me do aerobics Richard Simmons is a missing liar Lord, don't make me try hot yoga Because I can't fit in the pants And Lord, don't make me try regular yoga Because I'd rather pour a glass Don't make me do long form improv Cause I hate making these callbacks And Lord don't make me take up swimming Cause I don't like to be all wet Unlike your girl There's a love scene. This is a, it's about being too drunk at weddings. So let's slow down, folks. Slow down. It's a wedding night, flowers in bloom, a beautiful bride and a blushing groom. A shirtless drunk guy in the middle of the room during the father-daughter dance. It's a wedding romance. The vows are spoken in beautiful prose. Their love is magnificent, it grows and grows Why is that one guy so blacked out? Nobody knows I heard he came here on a bus It's a man full of I said if you didn't want me to get drunk at your wedding Then why did you make the drinks free? There shouldn't be unlimited alcohol at the time you're supposed to be fancy. But then you go to a football game where you're supposed to be drunk, and the beers cost like 13 bucks. But it's free when you're wearing a tux. I think that sucks. You might be wondering, why would he compare a wedding to a football game? And actually, I think they're kind of alike. <laughs> the priest is the ref, black and white. The server's a quarterback because she's passing out wine. The groomsmen are the offensive line because they're all fat as hell. <laughs> Wedding bells. Brad got married. <laughs> Uh, this next one, this is about going to the doctor, and 
sometimes when you go to the doctor, the problems you have aren't physical. Like you might have like a perfect body like I do, but there's still something wrong. And maybe it's spiritual, maybe it's your heart's broken. I don't know, this is a song kind of about that. Mr. Doctor, what would you prescribe? My heart is so broken, I'm barely alive. Mr. Doctor, what pills can I take? For I fear that my sweet little heart is starting to break. I need Viagra before my soul. I need Cialis before my emotions. And I need a penis pump before my heart. Need a penis pump, yeah. Oh, that's what I need. And before I go, I know we're all hurting, but let me just remind you guys that I am not a virgin. I'm those rumors aren't true No Alright, I didn't write an ending to this song So that's when the intermission and the musical will be and everyone will feel really good and all that stuff. And then we come out and it's the dark part. Oh, no. Oh, no, folks. Was that Brad's baby? <laughs> that was Mary. She's going to come do another impression of me. And <laughs> this, is, uh, so this is the dark part of the show. It's, it's about, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but I, I got robbed. <laughs> I have been robbed many times in my life Once with a fist and once with a knife It's the mean streets out there, it's the hard knock life But I'll never get robbed again I'm telling you I've got a plan I'll just go out and... You can't rob a guy who's naked A naked in the middle of the night I won't get arrested Because I am white I'm naked uh, The musical has one more song in it And it's another feel-good number um, But it's kind of It's about my soul searching You guys know I'm a very in introspective guy And um, I often wonder like, What could my life have been like If my life was different And this is kind of about that I was born a Catholic boy in Illinois My mom thought I'd be a priest by now But instead I'm a broke comedian A different kind of celibacy vow Sometimes I sit and wonder Is there another version of me? Yes, yeah, sometimes I sit and wonder Is there anything I could be? Well, I could have been a football player Because I've already got CTE And I could have been an English professor because I've already got low tea And I could have been a handyman Cause people already call me a tool I could have been 
A grade school teacher If I could only go near the school I could have been anything I could have been anything I could have been anything If I could only go near that school <laughs> There's one more thing I'm gonna do before I get out of here. Some of you guys know this about me. I'm like really famous for, really famous, that's it. Uh, some of you guys know uh, I do musical impressions. I don't know if anyone knew that about me. Um, so I'm gonna close the, the show with some of those. These are very famous, you've seen them all over. And uh, this first musical impression, this is Johnny Cash, if he, we're a little bitch. <laughs> I hurt myself today like a little bitch. <laughs> One totally new thing. This is a famous domestic abuser, John Lennon. Uh, look it up if uh, he were a little bit. Imagine this. It's easy if you try No hell below us I'm a little bitch <laughs> He just happens to be a little bitch There's one more, it's the last thing I'm gonna do before I get out of here and it's not connected to the first two at all. This is um, Linda Perry from the Four Non Blondes. If she just happened, do you understand? <laughs> to be a little bitch. Five years and my life is still trying to get up that great big hill of hope for a destination. I realized quickly, like I knew I should, that this world was made up of this brotherhood of man, or whatever that means. And so I cross sometimes when I'm lying in bed just to get it all out. What's in my head and I, I am feeling a little peculiar And so I wake in the morning and I stir my head and I take a deep breath And I get real high and I scream at the top of my lungs what's going on